Chapter 11 of Bushido, The Soul of Japan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Awaii in December 2009. Bushido, The Soul of Japan by Inazo Nitobe. Chapter 11 Self Control. The discipline of fortitude on the one hand, inculcating endurance without a groan, and the teaching of politeness on the other, requiring us not to mar the pleasure or serenity of another by manifestations of our own sorrow or pain, combined to engender a stoical turn of mind, and eventually to confirm it into a national trait of apparent stoicism. I say, apparent stoicism, because I do not believe that true stoicism can ever become the characteristic of a whole nation, and also because some of our national manners and customs may seem to a foreign observer hard-hearted. Yet we are really as susceptible to tender emotion as any race under the sky. I am inclined to think that in one sense we have to feel more than others, yes, doubly more, since the very attempt to restrain natural promptings entails suffering. Imagine boys, and girls too, brought up not to resort to the shedding of a tear or the uttering of a groan for the relief of their feelings, and there is a physiological problem whether such effort steals their nerves or makes them more sensitive. It was considered unmanly for a samurai to betray his emotions on his face. He shows no sign of joy or anger, was a phrase used in describing a strong character. The most natural affections were kept under control. A father could embrace his son only at the expense of his dignity. A husband would not kiss his wife, no, not in the presence of other people, whatever he might do in private. There may be some truth in the remark of a witty youth when he said, American husbands kiss their wives in public and beat them in private. Japanese husbands beat theirs in public and kiss them in private. Calmness of behavior, composure of mind, should not be disturbed by passion of any kind. I remember when, during the late war with China, a regiment left a certain town, a large concourse of people flocked to the station to bid farewell to the general and his army. On this occasion, an American resident resorted to the place, expecting to witness loud demonstrations, as the nation itself was highly excited, and there were fathers, mothers, and sweethearts of the soldiers in the crowd. The American was strangely disappointed, for as the whistle blew and the train began to move, the hats of thousands of people were silently taken off, and their heads bowed in reverential farewell, no waving of handkerchiefs, no word uttered, but deep silence in which only an attentive ear could catch a few broken sobs. In domestic life, too, I know of a father who spent whole nights listening to the breathing of a sick child, standing behind the door that he might not be caught in such an act of parental weakness. I know of a mother who, in her last moments, refrained from sending for her son that he might not be disturbed in his studies. Our history and everyday life are replete with examples of heroic matrons who can well bear comparison with some of the most touching pages of Plutarch. Among our peasantry, an Ian McLaren would be sure to find many a Margaret Ho. It is the same discipline of self-restraint which is accountable for the absence of more frequent revivals in the Christian churches of Japan. When a man or woman feels his or her soul stirred, the first instinct is to quietly suppress any indication of it. In rare instances is the tongue set free by an irresistible spirit when we have eloquence of sincerity and fervor. It is putting a premium upon a breach of the third commandment to encourage speaking lightly of spiritual experience. It is truly jarring to Japanese ears to hear the most sacred words, the most secret hard experiences, thrown out in promiscuous audiences. Dost thou feel the soil of thy soul stirred with tender thoughts? It is time for seeds to sprout. Disturb it not with speech, but let it work alone in quietness and secrecy, writes a young samurai in his diary. 
to give in so many articulate words one's inmost thoughts and feelings notably the religious is taken among us as an unmistakable sign that they are neither very profound nor very sincere only a pomegranate is he so runs a popular saying who when he gapes his mouth displays the contents of his heart it is not altogether perverseness of oriental minds that the instant our emotions are moved we try to guard our lips in order to hide them speech is very often with us as the frenchman defined it the art of concealing thought call upon a japanese friend in time of deepest affliction and he will invariably receive you laughing with red eyes or moist cheeks at first you may think him hysterical press him for an explanation and you will get a few broken commonplaces human life has sorrow they who meet must part he that is born must die it is foolish to count the years of a child that is gone but a woman's heart will indulge in follies and the like so the noble words of a noble hohenzollern lerne zu leiden ohne klagen had found many responsive minds among us long before they were uttered indeed the japanese have recourse to risibility whenever the frailties of human nature are put to severest test i think we possess a better reason than democritus himself for our abderian tendency for laughter with us oftenest veils an effort to regain balance of temper when disturbed by any untoward circumstance it is a counterpoise of sorrow or rage the suppression of feelings being thus steadily insisted upon they find their safety valve in poetical aphorism a poet of the tenth century writes in japan and china as well humanity when moved by sorrow tells its bitter grief in verse a mother who tries to console her broken heart by fancying her departed child absent on his wonted chase after the dragonfly hums how far today in chase i wonder has gone my hunter of the dragonfly i refrain from quoting other examples for i know i could do only scant justice to the pearly gems of our literature were i to render into a foreign tongue the thoughts which were wrung drop by drop from bleeding hearts and threaded into beads of rarest value i hope i have in a measure shown that inner working of our minds which often presents an appearance of callousness or of a hysterical mixture of laughter and dejection and whose sanity is sometimes called in question it has also been suggested that our endurance of pain and indifference to death are due to less sensitive nerves this is plausible as far as it goes the next question is why are our nerves less tightly strung it may be our climate is not so stimulating as the american it may be our monarchical form of government does not excite us as much as the republic does the frenchman it may be that we do not read sartor resartus as zealously as the englishman personally i believe it was our very excitability and sensitiveness which made it a necessity to recognize and enforce constant self-repression but whatever may be the explanation without taking into account long years of discipline and self-control none can be correct discipline and self-control can easily go too far it can well repress the genial current of the soul it can force pliant natures into distortions and monstrosities it can beget bigotry breed hypocrisy or habitate affections be a virtue never so noble it has its counterpart and counterfeit we must recognize in each virtue its own positive excellence and follow its positive ideal and the ideal of self-restraint is to keep our mind level as our expression is or to borrow a greek term attain the state of euthymia which democritus called the highest good End of chapter eleven